Hey, what's going on guys? Today we're going to be taking a look at the Gumpla 40th Anniversary Official Guidebook. So even though it's still technically a book, it has book in the title so we can just call it a book this time. This is really awesome for a couple of reasons. Number one is that everything in here is in Japanese and in English, which is awesome. So you don't need to worry about having to translate anything. The other cool thing is though, even though this is kind of a relatively thin one, there's a lot in here just about just kind of the history of Gumpla and we'll get into all of that in here in just a second, but it is a really cool if you're a fan. There's a lot of cool stuff in here and a lot of history, so let's go ahead and get right into it. All right, and so even though, like I said, it is thin, there's a lot of stuff packed into here, so there's going to be a lot to go through. Let's go ahead and get right into it here. Here we've got our introduction about the 40 historic years of Gunpla, and you can see a number of different 1 in 44 scale RX-782s here, but it starts off with the HGUC, so it's not going all the way back 40 years, so it's got the HGUC, the uh, 30th edition, the RG, that is, let's see, the HG Revive, the G40th version, uh, that is the Beyond Global version, and the Entry Grade there, so all of the more kind of current ones anyway. And then the next page, all about the Gumpla Link Project. So this is saying to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Gumpla, the Gumpla Link Project is meant to express Gumpla and connect it to the future through various things, people, and ideas with Link as the keyword. So we got Link the Future, Link the Fun, Link Other Fields, Link Town, Link Creators, and essentially just Bandai trying different things to just kind of make sure that, you know, Gumpla is going to stay re relevant into the future. Uh, as a hobby. Here we got all about the MGEX Unicorn. This is obviously, this um, publication came out before the MGEX uh, Strike Freedom, so this is gonna be our main MGEX focus here, but a lot of really cool photos there of the Unicorn. And then we've got Gateway to Gumpla here with the uh, emphasis on the entry grade Gundam, the RX-782 there as an entry point for people just for beginners to be able to try out Gumpla as just a super simple model kit. And then over here, a feature about the titanium version, the Gundarium alloy uh, version of the Gundam that came out and that was like $2,000 or something crazy like that. Super expensive, that all metal one and the 144 scale ARC-782 Gundam that came out. Then over here, we've got about the Beyond Global ARC-782 Gundam. So it says the pursuit of articulation and proportion. And I'm kind of, kind of just giving you guys this kind of overall idea about like what's in here, but there's obviously a lot more text that goes into more detail uh, about these. So do you guys can just kind of see in general what's kind of contained in this book, but there's a lot more information in there. And again, it's all in Japanese and in English, so that's awesome. Here we got about the PG Unleashed ARC-782 Gundam. Them. So it seems a bit, you know, kind of like just kind of advertising for different Bandai products essentially, but it is cool. I mean, if you go in and read the text, you can get kind of more uh, background information and kind of like the details of what kind of Bandai wanted to express with different parts of different kits and everything like that. So it is cool, aside from it being just an advertisement. Here's about the Gundam Factory Yokohama and the 1 to 1 scale walking Gundam there, a feature about that and then the different model kit versions of that. So the 100 scale version and the 144 scale version of that. Personally, not a fan of this version of the ARC-72 design. It's a bit too, I don't know, the colors of it almost kind of make it look very like stained glass, kind of uh, the coloring and the, like the details of it, how the panel lines of everything are. It's cool that it's got its own kind of distinctive look among the many, many different takes on the ARC-72. But yeah, it's not really for me. What do you guys think about that design? Here we got all about the Gumpla brand, the history of Gumpla. So starting off uh, from just like the non-graded kits. This section, unfortunately, seems like there is not any English here, but it's just like a, a one or two sentences about kind of each of the grades. So the first grade, EX model, entry grade, uh, HGUC, MG, RG, MGEX, uh, high resolution model, SDEX standard, SD cross silhouette, perfect grade, mega size model, RE100, SD BB Senshi, UC hard graph, and I would have to assume there's probably a, a couple that are even left off of this list. I don't know, I'm not sure, but yeah. Next section is about the history of Gunpla as in 1980 through 1999. So yeah, this would be kind of like what I, through 1999 is a really good. I feel like uh, point to kind of separate old and new Gunpla because anything from like 2000 onward is all like pretty modern uh, Gunpla. Anything 1999 and before is when you start to get into stuff that you know that definitely is going to show more age, especially like in the 80s, of course. The 90s kind of, I mean, kind of depends on how you define it, but certainly in the 90s the kits were not. Uh, 
quite as advanced as what we have now, but we did see the start of the HGUC line, the start of the MG line uh, was in the later part of the 90s. So um, that's where some of the lines that are so fantastic uh, now and still to this day, you know, got their humble beginnings back in the late 90s. And then here we're getting into 2000 to 2010, kind of where uh, we started to see kind of quite a lot of really great advancements to kind of what makes kits so good these days. We saw more uh, popularity of snap fit models there, the release of the HGUC 144 scale uh, RX-782 Gundam. When was that? Yeah, 1999. So I don't know why it's included in this section, but I guess it's late 1999, middle of 1999. It says it's in uh, May, actually. So May of 1999, but they just kind of threw it in this section. Uh, and then adaption of uh, adoption of new materials. Here it's talking about, at first, most of the plastic used in Gunpla was polystyrene, but its durability was insufficient for recreating complex moving joints transformation system. Uh, thus, ABS, resin, and other new materials were introduced. So when they started using more ABS in kits, which comes with its own issues as well. So I mean, not, there's not like, I guess, like a perfect material, but it's all kind of has different uses. We saw the introduction of the life-size Gundam statue in 2009, of course, so that was awesome. Interestingly that they're showing, these are only the photos of it once it was moved to its like permanent location in front of the Gundam base, but it was actually originally constructed, you know, right nearby there in just kind of a different corner of uh, Daiba, the man-made island there in Tokyo, and then it was moved uh, to its proper location there in front of the Gundam base eventually. Um, but we also saw the introduction of the Mega Size model. I love the Mega Size models and really hope that we get some more of those in the future, including the uh, Unicorn here, which definitely came out after 2010, but they're just kind of including that because that's just one of the very few Mega Size models that exist. The introduction of the Real Grade line came out at this time as well. So a lot of really great things started in that time period. And then we've got 2011 to 2020 here. Of course, we saw the introduction of the Figure Eyes Labo line, it's sort of gun I guess it does that count because it's Gundam character plastic models, right? Well some of them anyway, not all of them actually just the one I guess there's only a few out in that line and just the Fumino one would be a Gundam character I believe but we saw the MG 3.0 Gundam the uh, RX-72 revive and uh, that was not the only and then we saw just kind of the whole revive line in general one thing that I've just kind of been passing uh, as we've been going through this but here we have like a question and answer bit here uh, will the evolution project continue for example and then down here you have an answer I guess from Ben so like a question I guess it's probably just like a, a popular question and then Bandai's official answer for this so for example it says the evolution project will continue to be a necessary project for the evolution of gunpla and plastic models therefore the 40th anniversary the pg unleashed was positioned as the culmination of the current evolution project but we are planning to proceed with new projects aimed towards upcoming 45th and 50th anniversary so i think that means that it will essentially continue but not under the same name so like the pg unleashed was kind of the end of the evolution project and then they're going to do something different uh, but anyway, this kind of question and answer section you can see is like here in blue. So there's a few, there's another one right here. Kind of this one is why the difference in materials for various parts. So that's kind of, again, talking about the use of ABS. They're here, can polycaps be painted? There's a good one. So this says basically no, <laughs> polycaps cannot be painted. Polycaps are made out of polyethylene, which has a high chemical resistance to plastic model paint, causing it to not adhere once dried. So kind of interesting that question and answer bit, uh, kind of the topics that they're tackling there are actually really quite frequently asked questions among a lot of Gunpla modelers. So that's really cool that they're including that in here. Here's another question over here. Uh, about will there be other MG version 3.0 kits following the Gundam? That's another one. Here it says, we have shown the evolution of MG through the RX-782 and on the occasion of the 40th anniversary, grades that represent further extreme evolution such as MGEX and PG Unleashed have been launched. Here, we select the mobile suits that can embody the best current technology according to the needs at the times and the progress of technology. This will be linked to the evolution project and we plan and to select a lineup that will surprise and impress our customers. So they're basically kind of giving a non-answer there as to whether there'll be any other 3.0 model kits. Uh, possibly, probably, but yeah, they did not really saying for sure one way or the other. 
Uh, we saw the RE100 line was introduced in this time as well. So there's a bunch of the RE100 lineup right there. Uh, minus, I think maybe just like uh, what came out after the Hamahama. I'm not sure. Not really too much else after that. That's probably one of the most recent ones. As far as I can remember, but I'm sure there was something else that I'm forgetting. So the builder's parts line and also, let's see, just um, enrichment of related products here. So different parts like decals, these hobby bases, the tools and stands and things like that. This was more kind of like a lot of that came out certainly before 2010. And a lot of this also came out alongside with the uh, 30 minutes missions line. So the 30 minutes mission stuff, which a lot of that can be used for Gunpla as well. But um, and we saw the release of the figureized bust and figureized labo of certain Gundam characters, kind of mostly focusing in here on uh, Hoshino Fumina, of course. And another really great question uh, right down here, the development of new KPS material. There's a material called KPS, uh, which is lighter and has better wear resistance, has been adopted as an alternative to polycaps since it no longer is necessary to incorporate polycaps in joints made with KPS. It is now possible to make uh, smaller joint parts and internal frames. So this would be just like that kind of uh, different feel of plastic. It's kind of a little bit more of like a softer feeling plastic that Bandai uses in like basically all their kits now. And so it makes it less necessary to use polycaps. And that's why you see a lot of kits coming out these days with uh, less or no polycaps used in them. So the question is here, will polycaps disappear with the adoption of KPS? And it says, uh, since each type of plastic has its strengths and weaknesses, Gumpla uses suitable materials for each purpose. Therefore, we doubt that polycaps will disappear due to the appearance of KPS. So basically they're saying that no, polycaps aren't gonna completely disappear. They'll still be necessary in certain kits. Uh, but I think it's fair to assume that we will certainly see less polycaps in a lot of kits going forward, but they're not gonna completely disappear. Uh, evolution of molds here, talking about how they can now like mold certain parts like this, like the Zaku shoulder shield used to always, you know, it would have to be two halves and you had to put that together and it's got a seam line, but now they're able to mold parts like that as just a single solid piece, which is just kind of one of the many reasons uh, why Bandai is the best at what they do, that they develop things like that that other model companies just uh, either haven't or weren't able to do. And this is getting kind of to a little bit more of like the technical side of the development, but design evolution and the Meister system, talking about uh, the design process there. How are the molds different between then and now? The precision of Gumpla design, the accuracy and of shape, recreation and assembly of parts and molds has improved dramatically with the introduction of computers. However, the basic role itself has not changed in the sense of molds for creating shapes. So basically, they use computers now, obviously much more than they did like in the 80s, but the, but the actual process of you know using molds to make the kits is essentially the same. Um, the evolution of assembly manuals, that's another really cool aspect to see, like going, taking a look at like older manuals compared to new ones, how user-friendly. Uh, and beginner friendly, the new manuals are, they're so easy to follow. And some of the older ones, you know, you have to have a little bit better understanding kind of of how stuff goes together. They're not quite as straightforward. And, and then like the change as far as like different things that are included in the manuals, like the technical illustrations and the older master grade manuals, how that's kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, the, in the Verka kits, there's usually like a section of text of like uh, Katoki is kind of introduction or it's sometimes like a Q and A section like with Katoki talking about his design in those kits. So different things like that included in the manuals. Evolution of joint articulation there. That's obviously something we've seen uh, improve dramatically in the more recent high grades, especially kind of older high grades compared to newer high grades. It's something that's certainly improved quite a bit in master grades as well. Uh, evolution of molding colors there. You get these bright fluorescent colors, molded gold colors, things like that we see quite often. Uh, product design to hide the seams. Yes, something that Bandai certainly got better with and they still like seem a bit random sometimes and like they'll have a, a new kit that has really great uh, hiding the seams and then other ones that where there's like quite obvious seams that seems like it would have been pretty easy to hide but they didn't for some reason. The question here is but is it difficult to design without seam lines? Yes, that's something that I would be curious to know because it seems like to me there's some kits that you see and it's like kind of seems like 
why didn't they design it in this, just a different way to hide the seams? And here the answer is, it is very difficult to achieve a seamless design for a plastic model as you cannot make a seamless sphere without a standard sized plastic model. It's kind of a weird answer there. I think it's the, maybe a little bit lost in translation. It says the, uh, the seams that occur are designed in such a way that are located in places that look natural for most people. Yeah, ideally, but anyway, so again, it's not really that great of an answer, but they're basically just saying that it's, it's hard to make everything without in seam lines, but they try their best to kind of hide them, especially in more modern uh, model kits. Was Gumpla the first to apply undergates and touch gates? Interesting question. Gumpla was not the first to apply undergates and touch gates. Touch gates would be like the SD kits and the entry grade kits where you can just, uh, the gates are so small that you can just pop the parts out without the use of tools. It says the advantage of undergates is that the surface of the finished product, the surface visible after assembly, is kept clean, especially for chrome plated parts as there are no visible gate marks. Touch gates are technology introduced uh, with the Musha Maruden series uh, from the SDBB Senshi line. So again, uh, so they said that no, Gumplo was not the first to apply that technology, but they didn't really go into any other further elaboration. Uh, they basically just kind of defined what those terms mean. But all right, Gumpla 40th anniversary official guidebook, the Gumpla in the anime. So here we've got Build Fighters, uh, beginning G, build, fi uh, build fighters, build fighters try. So kind of about the whole evolution of the like, Gumpla building in the anime and those different series. The obviously the uh, Gumpla builders beginning G, a much much less popular take on that. Uh, gonna build divers and gonna build divers re rise. So kind of a bit about the Gumpla building in the anime series. So uh, here we got a. Uh, special kind of section here about mechanical designer Kunio Okawara, special interview. So actually this is different questions and answers for Kunio Okawara-san, which of course quite famous uh, mecha designer, especially in Gundam of course. Some of the questions here for example are, do you think there are clear differences in mecha design between Gundam and other works? Which elements were you conscious of in the Gundam mobile suits you designed, Gundam and mobile suits you designed? How do you feel about the Gundam designs from younger designers? So some interesting questions here for Okawara-san. And here we have a mechanical designer, uh, Kanetake Ebikawa, Ebikawa-san, more known for some of the more modern um, designs in Build Fighters and I believe Gundam 00 as well as, as well as others. When you redesign an existing Gundam as a new Gunpla in other works, like the Build series, how do you go about the redesign? It's a good question. It's been 40 years since the birth of Gunpla. What direction do you think Gunpla should take in the future? Another good one. And Gunpla technology is evolving day by day. Do these new technologies also affect mecha design? So I think just he means like kind of other mecha designs in general. All interesting stuff. Next up is about the Gundam base, the history of Gunpla. So yeah, the Gundam base there in Tokyo, the main one, wasn't always a Gundam base. Of course, originally it was the Gundam Front, Tokyo and then they changed it to Gundam Base, but uh, kind of interesting to know, and they have a bit here about the Gundam Base Korea. As some of you guys may not know is that the in Korea, they were all Gundam Base uh, before the main one in Tokyo changed to the Gundam Base. So I think uh, Bandai had just used that name uh, outside of Japan, outside the main Gundam Front Tokyo. They had started using the Gundam Base name, and I guess they just wanted to kind of uh, centralize everything under the same name of the Gundam Base. So they changed Gundam Front Tokyo to the Gundam base. But yeah, now we've got them all over. There's Gundam base of Fukuoka, Gundam base Shanghai, Gundam base Taiwan, Gundam base Korea. I'm not sure about in uh, other countries, but I know at least in Korea, there's a number of uh, Gundam bases there. I don't know, probably six, seven, eight of them, maybe something like that. It's quite a few. Ah, uh, yes. And now the section that is going to surely get a lot of flack here is about Premium Bandai, the history of Gunpla part five about Premium Bandai. We all kind of know what it's about. I'm interested to see what the question is gonna be here. What are the advantages of Premium Bandai? What's Bandai's official answer for that? It says, since Premium Bandai sells products directly to its customers, it is possible to accurately understand sales performance and popularity trends, making it easier to come up with a product lineup that leads to improved customer satisfaction. That it's somewhat of an interesting answer, just because that is something that I don't know if I really ever have considered that much. Obviously, uh, one advantage for Bandai, which they're not going to put in here, is that 
selling the products directly to the customers, Bandai makes a higher profit off of them through pre through P Bandai. So you know, Bandai makes more per kit, which is good for Bandai. Sure, they make more money. But I guess based on the sales of those kits, it does allow them to kind of get a more accurate reading on you know which type of designs are more popular, like like the weapon add-on sets, for example or some like really super obscure things or like um, effect parts sets or sets like the 36 unit of the uh, Maganak set for example. So I mean there's definitely legitimate criticisms that you can have uh, against Premium Bandai and you know being frustrated with Premium Bandai releases but I do kind of get where they're coming from in that aspect that it allows them to get a better uh, sense of you know what is more popular for them to release and then they can kind of use that information uh, for their standard releases as to what they're going to ultimately produce as a standard release products but that's interesting anyway then up next we've got Gumpla X Company collaboration Gundam so here are different collaboration releases so this one is like the Almond X Gundam version of the HG Xeong there for example the Maro 17 version of the Zaku the Georgia Coffee version of the Gundam Uniqlo versions of the HG Zaku and Gundam there and some other different ones here Eniki and oh, let's see what are these oh Japan Pro Baseball I think these are these are the different all the different uh, pro baseball team versions that they released of these different mobile suits J League over here different versions of the Strike the Barbatos the Exia all the other kind of model kits there uh, Luna C JR um, Train colors series so different kind of variation color releases of these based on kind of different collaborations that Bandai has done then we've got the Gundam G 40th industrial design version so all about that release it's been a couple years now so we're all quite familiar with that kit at this point but here's some really cool uh, actual illustrations of these because it, I think I'm probably not alone in wishing that they would release a version of the Zaku and both of these, either this Shars Zaku or the standard Zaku 2. Uh, these would be really great to get as model kits as well because I, as the Gundam the G40 design, I can appreciate it. It's fine. It's not my favorite take on the RX-78 2. Uh, these versions of the Zakus though are really cool. I do really like this redesign of the Zaku 2. It's really quite interesting. I would love model kits of those, so it's cool to see those featured in here. Uh, here we got about the characters from that kind of short animation as well. Amuro, Shar, Amuro's mother uh, from that G 40th animation. And then the Gumpla box art gallery. So I think this is probably one of the last things here is just a gallery of Gumpla box art and how that's changed through the years. So some of the very early box art there uh, from Masayuki Hasegawa. And I guess these are just kind of uh, featuring some of the different uh, artists who did some of the artwork here from Ryuko Masuo. All these, I love these uh, classic MSV uh, box arts, those are really cool. Not the double Zeta there, of course, but anyway, some of the MSV ones, those are really awesome. Here it says, how are the package illustrations different between then and now? So, I mean, obviously there's kind of a lot of differences, but let's see, who's next? Uh, Yuji Kaida, who did some of these artworks for um, Double O, it looks like, Zeta, some more MSV stuff. Did I say double O? I mean double O eighty. And also, let's see, double O eighty three as well. I'm not sure, but the F ninety one series, the V Gundam, uh, some of the Master Grade box art there. Over here, we've got Koma and Hiroyuki Yamamoto, which is like some of the most recent box art uh, designs that we see right there. Then Naochika Morishita, which again is a lot of these modern ones that you would recognize from quite recent releases. And Hidetaka Tenjin as well. Some of these really cool box arts, some classic MG box arts there of like the Goof Custom, uh, some from the 8th MS team, the Gym Sniper, the Gun Tank, the G Fighter. So really cool stuff there. On the last inside page, just an advertisement for uh, Gundam, Mobile Suit Gundam Hathaway, Hathaway's Flash. Really cool artwork right there and that is it so yeah like I said even though it's a pretty uh, small one there's a lot of content in there just kind of going through a lot of different aspects of the history of Gunplus so really cool 
little MOOC here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And like I said, there was a lot more information in there that we obviously can't get to, but I would highly recommend you guys pick this up if you're interested. I mean, if you're just a Gumpla fan in general, I think this is just a really cool uh, thing that just kind of captures a lot of history of Gumpla. And I mean, of course, it's all just an advertisement, uh, essentially. But it's really cool to read. I really enjoyed taking a look through that one. So hopefully you guys did as well. Let me know down in the comment section what were some of the most interesting parts in this. I think the, the question and answer parts where Bandai kind of sort of answered some of like kind of the most frequently asked questions. I know that I hear from a lot of you guys and some of the questions that I have as well about like why Bandai does certain things. That was probably the most interesting part in there. But let me know your guys' thoughts down in the comment section below. And as always, guys, if you know if you're looking for some Gunpla or tools, paints and supplies and all that good stuff to pick up to play with for yourself. You can check the link to US Gundam store down in the video description down below. We've got all sorts of good stuff there for you guys to check out. If you'd also like to like and or subscribe while you're here, I would greatly appreciate it. But until next time, guys, have a great day. We'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.